I can walk pretty good now because it just gets people from bed. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning again, and if you would, I'll have you turn to Revelation chapter, actually the end of chapter 8. We're going to touch just on the end of the chapter here. So it's been a couple weeks now, but you may recall in the last message we looked at chapter 8, and we began to talk about the trumpet judgments. And so today we're going to continue on with that. <clears throat> so in chapter 8, the... The first four trumpet judgments really focused on judgments that affected the natural realm. Uh, and they were quite, uh, to be frank, they were quite shocking. They were severe. Uh, they included everything from hail and fire and blood and the waters being turned to blood, the waters being poisoned with wormwood, uh, so on and so forth and uh, it was really quite devastating. But at the same time, we talked about the fact that the destruction was not complete. And so even there, we can see the mercy of God in still giving people time to repent, uh, time to turn away from their sin and to turn towards Christ. And so today we will pick up, I'm actually gonna begin reading in verse 13 of chapter eight and then read through chapter 9 to through verse 11. <clears throat> Looking at Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, the word of God says, Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and the smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it, they will long to die, and death flees from them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is the power to hurt men for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. With that, let's open on a word of prayer. <coughs> Father, I ask you to help us today with this text. Uh, I ask that each and every person gathered here today will get from this text exactly what they need to hear from it. We ask that your word have its way in us and that your spirit would be with us. Help us to understand and believe the word that we have here before us. We ask ultimately that all eyes would be turned to Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, there's really no other way for me to say it. This is, this is a heavy, heavy text. Uh, and even as chapter 8 was heavy, we find that chapter 9 gets even heavier. Uh, at the tail end of chapter 8 and verse 13, we have a warning. And I'm including this in this message because we never really addressed it in the last message as we wrapped up chapter 8. Uh, but depending on 
which translation of the Bible you have, your translation would either read here that this was an angel or an eagle that is making this proclamation. And this is one of those relatively rare places where we have differences in the manuscript traditions, okay? So if you have a King James or a New King James, uh, something that is based on the received text, then yours says angel. And if you have one of the later translations, then it will say eagle. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I just want to point out that since the King James was translated, we have many, many, many thousands of more manuscripts at our disposal than we had when the King James was translated. And so scholars have gone back, they've compared all of these individual manuscripts, and to the best of their ability, they have determined that most likely Eagle was the original translation. And I will simply say we could probably see if we looked at the rest of Revelation and how involved angels are, somebody saying, wait a second, eagle doesn't sound right, maybe it's supposed to be angel, or so on and so forth. But I don't want us to get lost in the detail here. I've said this many, many times. If we look at the individual discrepancies in the manuscripts, no doctrine is affected. And to discount the word of God simply because of a couple um, little differences in wording uh, would be like throwing your map away when you're in the woods because you spilled the drop of coffee down in the corner of it. Uh, this is not going to affect our understanding of this text at all, and so I just want to point that out. Um, so whether it is an eagle or an angel, the point here is clear. We have a uh, three-pronged woe here. Woe, woe, woe. One for each of the trumpet blasts that is yet to be sounded. And as severe as the judgments were in chapter 8, we find that the remaining judgments that come are even more severe than the first four. And that is basically building us towards this crescendo that we have here in chapter 9. <clears throat> The woe is for those who dwell on the earth. And as we have discussed previously, those that dwell on the earth in the book of Revelation is practically a technical term. And it's a term that refers to unbelievers, the wicked that dwell on the earth. Uh, and that is who this specifically is speaking to. Woe to those who dwell on the earth, the unbelieving wicked. So in verse 1 of chapter 9, the fifth angel sounds his trumpet and a star falls from heaven and the key is given to him. Now it's very interesting and I believe telling here that after this star falls, um, we have a personified view here. So clearly the star that fell represents a being, some type of person. And oftentimes in scripture, we find that stars represent angels. And the big debate here around this uh, angel tends to be, is it a good angel? Is it a holy angel? Is it a fallen angel? Or is it a specific fallen angel? Specifically, is this Satan that's being referenced here? And honestly, uh, you know, we could debate this at length. I tend to... Uh, favor the view that it's actually a reference to Satan. And if we look at other verses that reference Satan, uh, I think that it's a reasonable connection to make. But again, whether this is, uh, whatever type of angel this is, it really doesn't affect our interpretation of the rest of the verse. <clears throat> the, the angel or Satan himself, if that be the case, is given a key, a key to the pit or the abyss. And uh, scripture speaks of a place where the fallen angels are held until the time of their final judgment. Uh, of course, as we read later on in Revelation, their final abode will be in the lake of fire with the rest of the wicked. But in the meantime, many are being held in bonds until the time of their final judgment. <clears throat> in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, uh, we find what speaks to what I and many others believe to be a reference to angels that departed from their normal course and actually were involved in inappropriate relations with human beings and then fell under God's judgment. 
And we see this referenced other places in Scripture as well. And I believe that's exactly what Peter refers to in 2 Peter 2, 4 and following. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness held for judgment. And so the word that Peter uses here for hell isn't the normal word that we would see in the New Testament. He uses rather the Greek term Tartarus, which is a reference to the underworld. And so I believe that's exactly what he is talking to is this same abyss that we see referenced here in Revelation. Also, Jude refers to such a place in Jude 6. Now I want to remind you, though you know everything once and for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these he has kept in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And so we see other places in Scripture, the idea that there is an abyss or a pit where all the fallen angels, we might refer to them now as demons, uh, are being held. And uh, I believe that's what's being referenced here as well. <clears throat> so the, the angel or Satan himself, whoever this may be, is given a key to the abyss. And I think this is a very important point, one of the, if not the most important point for, for us to take away from this particular section is the idea of what this key represents. Because the key symbolizes or represents to us that this is being done by permission. So in other words, the demonic horde that is about to be unleashed here, they didn't escape. They didn't break their bonds and, and flee out against God's wishes. A key was given with the purpose of them being released from their bonds for a time. And that is exactly what we see here. God is sovereign and he is in control of all things. And when I say that, yes, I mean all things. He is in complete control of everything that happens in the created order. Um, I'm very fond of a statement by R.C. Sproul, one of my favorite theologians, and he said if there's one renegade molecule in the universe, then God is not sovereign. And so ultimately, all things that come to pass ultimately happen directly or indirectly by the will of God. Uh, very, very important point, I believe, uh, for us as people of faith to understand and to believe. Uh, and as I said earlier, this is not just a nice uh, sideline bit of theology. This affects ultimately how we will live our life and how we will view the world. And I think it's especially important as we go through times like these that we're in now when uh, we see things happening in society and so forth, not to lose hope and lose fact of the fact that God is still on the throne and there is nothing taking place that is a surprise to God and there's nothing taking place that is outside the ultimate control of God. Uh, and this needs to be a, a very strong source of comfort for us. Uh, I want to kind, to kind of pepper you or overwhelm you with what Scripture has to say about the sovereignty of God. And of course, we don't have time in our brief time meeting together today for me to go to each and every Bible reference but I really want to try to overwhelm you with how clear I find this to be in Scripture, the idea of God's sovereignty. So I'm going to do that kind of a rapid-fire staccato approach, if you will. Psalm 115.3 reads, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Daniel 4.35 All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. Isaiah 14, 27. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, 
and who will turn it back? Isaiah 43, 13. Also, henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Isaiah 45, 7. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create, create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Isaiah 46, 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Uh, this is an important thing for us to understand. Uh, and I can tell you, I'm, I'm not above admitting to you, I can easily become discouraged when I see the way the world is going sometimes. And it is these types of scriptures that I find comfort in because I remember, yes, God is in control. Uh, I may not understand it at the time, but He is accomplishing His purposes through everything that we see going on around us, even in times that we don't understand. Classically, there is the story of Joseph. We find Joseph in the Old Testament. He is despicably sold into slavery by his own brothers. Uh, he winds up a slave in Egypt, and then through very difficult circumstances at times, through God's providence, he is raised up to the second most powerful person in all the nation of, e of Egypt, the most powerful nation on, in the world at that time. And God uses Joseph to not only save the Egyptian nation from a famine, but also subsequently his entire family, which of course includes Jacob and all of his children, which was to become the nation of Israel. The entire future of the nation of Israel hung in the balance in this situation. And God, through very uh, evil and difficult circumstances, uses Joseph to save his people. And when Jacob later dies, his brothers are terrified that Joseph is going to have revenge on them and that he is going to put them to death. And I want to read to you Joseph's response. We find this in Genesis 50, verses 19 and 20. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to keep many people alive. And honestly, this is one of the most amazing things to me personally about God. Despite the ill will, the evil intent of human beings, God is powerful to the point he can override human intent and then use it for good. Uh, and this is an amazing truth that we find all through scripture. God is sovereign and he is control of all things. And even when even people, evil people run amok and they are simply carrying about their own evil intent, uh, God is not thwarted. Uh, Romans 8.28 tells us that he can use all things for good to those who love him. Uh, even when we don't understand how it's all going to work out, even when we can't see the good in a situation, ultimately God can bring good out of it. Another great example of how God works in his sovereignty is from our verses from the bulletin day, today in the book of Job. And as I said earlier, we see that Satan cannot touch Job apart from God giving him permission. Uh, and God says, go ahead, you can take his health, just don't kill him. And we see Job uh, severely tested, but his faith stands. And God is glorified because Job's faith stands, even though Job didn't understand the things that were happening to him. But Job was untouchable unless God had granted Satan permission to lay a hand on him. <clears throat> the greatest example, of course, was the most heinous crime that has ever been committed in the history of the universe, which was the betrayal and the killing of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, Evil men, through their own selfish motivations, 
had Jesus crucified on the cross, although he had done absolutely nothing wrong. And of course, God uses this to bring about the greatest good that could ever happen. And Peter actually makes this point when he preaches at Pentecost in Acts 2, verses 22 and following. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him from the dead, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So even though these men acted in their own selfish, uh, evil way, God had already purposed before the foundation of the world to use as the means by which many, many sinners would be saved. And you can see in Scripture that Satan had a hand in this as well. Because we read in the Gospels that Satan entered Judas when Judas left to betray Jesus. And Satan probably thought, you know what, I'm really going to get one over on God this time. And yet, even in Satan's plan, all he ended up doing was bringing about the foredetermined plan of God uh, to bring about the means by which God would use to save those that would be redeemed. Uh, very, very important that we understand uh, how God works here. Uh, there are a lot of false ideas that have crept into people's thinking in the popular culture. Uh, but God and Satan are not equals that are involved in this battle for, for supremacy. Uh, we have to remember that when we look at Scripture, Satan is an angel. He's a created being, and he is in no way comparable to God the Almighty. Uh, God created Satan as an angel. Satan sinned and rebelled against him. And we have to remember this battle is over it was over before it even started and uh, spoiler alert here but when we get to the end of revelation we will see that satan ends up in the lake of fire right he's sizzling if you can remember those old commercials uh, <clears throat> and that's how this is going to end up satan in no way is capable of thwarting the ultimate plans of god but we find these ideas in the popular culture, and if we're not careful, they can creep their way into our thinking as well. But ultimately, this is where I'm at biblically. Satan is only around and allowed to do anything at all because ultimately he only ends up in fulfilling God's ultimate purposes. Uh, God could have snapped his fingers and snuffed Satan out instantly if he had chosen to. But for his own purposes, he has decided not to. God is sovereign. He is in complete control and no one gets one over on God. You can't surprise him. You can't outwit him and you can't outmuscle him. He is the supreme being of the universe and he is in control of all things. Part of my job as shepherd is to help protect the flock and I can tell you there is some very dangerous and blasphemous teaching that has crept its way into the global church. But I'm here to tell you, don't let anyone ever get you to question the sovereignty of God. Uh, there are some very dangerous doctrines out there this day that would have you believe that God somehow cannot foreknow the will of free will creatures and all of this stuff. Well, Scripture will have none of it. Uh, he is the sovereign God of the universe. He is in complete control. Uh, and I say away with the false gods that people create in their own minds. And let's focus on the God of Scripture as God has revealed himself to be. So, again, while I have the opportunity, I want to make sure that I stress the sovereignty of God. Particularly in texts like we have before us. And with that, let's get back to the focus text. So we have the abyss opened and a picture of the smoke pouring out 
to the point that it darkens the landscape, it starts to blot out the sun and the air grows dark. And then we have locusts coming out of the smoke. Uh, the locusts continue the general pattern here of these judge, judgments that we find being parallels to the plagues that God brought against Egypt uh, prior to the Exodus, prior to him bringing his people out of Egypt. And the locust plague was actually the eighth such plague that God brought against the nation of Egypt. But these are no ordinary locusts. They are vi that's very clear from the description that follows here. They have the power of scorpions in their tails, and we read the following description, and I'm just going to read this again to refresh our memory. The, the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is the power to hurt men for five months. <clears throat> so clearly we can see these are not ordinary locusts. These are uh, demonic locusts, if you would, uh, and there is something very, very different about them. Uh, This is generally speaking somewhat vague for us to think about locusts, I think. Uh, living in the state of Maine, I don't know about you, but I don't have much past experience with hordes of locusts or anything. But I can tell you for people of the ancient world, especially people that uh, relied on agricultural society around them, the, the idea of a locust plague was absolutely terrifying to people. And I want to help us paint a picture here just a little bit. I actually want to read to you from a commentary by Barclay because it's really impossible, I think, for us to appreciate this text without us having some idea of what these locusts were all about. So quoting from Barclay's commentary, the locusts breed in the desert places and invade the cultivated lands for food. They may be about two inches in length with a wingspan of four to five inches. They belong to the same family as the household cricket and the grasshopper. They will travel in a column a hundred feet deep and as much as four miles long. When such a cloud of locusts appears, it is as if there had been eclipse of the sun and even great buildings less than 200 feet away cannot be seen. They bring a black cloud of darkness over the earth. The destruction they cause is beyond belief. When they have left an area, not a blade of grass is to be seen. The trees are stripped of their bark. The ground looks as if it had been burned with fire and scattered with ash. Land where the locusts have settled looks as if it had been scorched with a brush fire. Not one single living thing is left. Their destructiveness can best be appreciated from the fact that it is recorded in an 1866 a plague of locusts invaded Algiers and so total was the destruction which they caused that 200,000 people perished of famine in the days which followed. The noise of the millions of their wings is variously described. It is described as being like the dashing of waters in a mill wheel or like the sound of a great cataract. When the millions of them settle on the ground, the sound of their eating has been described as being like the crackling of a prairie fire. The sound of them on the march is like heavy rain falling on a distant forest. It has always been noticed that the head of the locust is in fact like the miniature head of a, of a horse. For that reason, the Italian word for locust is cavaletta and the German hepford. <coughs> So that kind of gives us a description or an idea here. This is, if we can use the word ordinary for a, a locust invasion, which I, I feel a little funny doing, this speaks to ordinary locusts. But can we imagine the terror involved when we consider the destruction caused by these demonic locusts? 
So locusts are a symbol and a threat of judgment throughout the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Joel, and they are closely associated with God's judgment in the day of the Lord. Uh, and these, as I said, are no ordinary locusts. These are even more terrifying. <clears throat> as we read, the focus of the natural locusts is vegetation. Uh, they attack and eat every green thing, grass, trees, whatever is available. But here we find once again they are expressly uh, kept from, from attacking the plants and the vegetation. Here their focus is on men, on human beings. And that focus is again limited by God and we see again God's sovereignty here. They are not allowed to do anything they want to do willy-nilly but God limits them from attacking the vegetation and they are only allowed to torment those who do not bear the mark of God. So again, we see God's protection on his own people and we see the judgment that falls on the unbelieving. In the previous trumpet judgments, nature and the earth were affected. Here we see that the judgment falls directly on mankind. Uh, the demonic locusts have the power of scorpions in their tails, and their business is to torment, which when I read the New Testament, it seems to me that demons are particularly good at that task, at causing people distress and torment. And again, the idea of a scorpion sting probably doesn't speak very loudly to us up here in the Northeast, but I can tell you if you go out in the western part of the United States, particularly the southwest, Arizona, uh, areas like that, they have a very healthy respect for scorpions. And it isn't so much that the sting of a scorpion is deadly per se, although it can kill people, it's rather extremely painful. And so that is the picture that we find here painted for us. <clears throat> so. What are these locusts actually? And I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure I really have a good answer for that. There are such varied interpretations here. Um, it, it's hard to even summarize them all. They vary from everything that, uh, you know, some people see here, the Parthians, we talked about them earlier. They were basically the only military force in the world that the Romans actually feared. Uh, they were very fierce warriors very good on horseback and they had perfected the ability to shoot backwards. Uh, it has been said that while they retreated up hillsides they were so accurate shooting backwards uh, that in one occasion at least they killed I believe two legions of Romans while they were re retreating and so the Romans quickly learned not to chase them. Uh, so that would terrify people in John's time particularly people of uh, the Roman culture, they would perhaps get that type of a picture. That varies all the way to some people seeing here a reference to modern helicopters and the fact that they might have armament in the rear and so forth and have their quote-unquote sting in their tails. Well, I'm here to tell you I'm not so much concerned about how we interpret this as long as we are left with a sense of exactly how terrifying, how horrifying, and how shocking this judgment really is. And I have to tell you, while I was preparing this message, all I could think about was a scene in the movie Armageddon. Uh, in Armageddon, they are trying to thwart an asteroid that is headed towards Earth, and they're sending a team up to this asteroid to try to stop it. And the NASA scientists are explaining how uh, dangerous the conditions are going to be on this asteroid and Owen Wilson's character asked the question well what's it going to be like up there and the NASA scientist said plus 200 in the Sun minus 200 degrees in the shade volcanic eruptions unstable gravitational conditions so on and so forth and Owen Wilson's character says just say the most terrifying conditions imaginable. Mm -hmm. The most terrifying conditions imaginable. And honestly, I think that's how we're supposed to feel about this text. It's not so important how we interpret what these demonic hordes are, but that we get a sense that this is going to be an absolutely horrifying time.
to be on the planet earth if you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this torment lasts a very long time. Uh, the the uh, length of time here, we are told expressly twice that it's going to be five months. And this is not a random number, that's actually the exact life cycle of a natural locust is from the time that they are hatched right through their life cycle is exactly five months, uh, which I find extremely interesting. Conditions will be so bad during that time, we are told in verse six, people will desperately want to die, but they will not be able to. And I believe, yes, that's exactly what the text says, is somehow they will be supernaturally unable to die by any means. Uh, so there will be no escape from the conditions that are on the earth. And yes, I, I realize as I stand here and I describe this to you, it is utterly horrible to think about. And I think that's exactly the point. Uh, and it's something that is uncomfortable to, to think about, but we are supposed to do exactly that. The locust hordes have over them a leader one with an appropriate name in Hebrew, Abaddon, which means destruction. And in Greek, Apollyon, which means destroyer. And that it will exactly be their business. Again, these are chilling portraits of the judgments that await those who refuse to repent. And again, this, these are not judgments that affect the people of God. We are expressly told uh, they are to avoid the people that have the mark of God on their foreheads that represents the people of God. But this is a chilling and very sobering account of the judgment that awaits those who refuse to turn from their sin and place their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ died so that he would take the punishment that we deserve upon himself so that we could be restored in relationship with God and so that we would need not fear any future judgment. And I say to you this day, if you already know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have no reason to fear these judgments. But I bet you know people who do. And this is good motivation, if not for ourselves, to reach out to the lost with these such passages in mind and try to reach them with the good news of Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, he is our only hope of escaping the judgment of God. God takes sin very seriously. Uh, and we can see that when we look at these judgments that we have laid out for us in the book of Revelation. And we can see it when we see what his son endured in our place so that we wouldn't have to. Uh, God takes sin seriously. And again, I see still in this passage the opportunity for people to repent, to turn from their sin and trust in Jesus Christ. With that, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, please have this very, very difficult text. Have it have your way in us this day. Uh, have it motivate us. Whether we need to turn to Christ ourselves, whether we have yet to trust fully in Jesus for our salvation or whether it motivate us to reach a dying world that desperately needs to hear the truth uh, that needs to hear about their sin problem and what you have provided as a means of escape and Lord we just ask that all eyes would be drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ and in his name we pray Amen. 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 so thank you and I hope you all have a very blessed Sunday